The scene unfolds before us, where a girl appears, like an angel with golden hair and eyes glowing in a violet hue. Her gentle greeting sounds in the magical world of Fantasia, encompassing all those present. People, looking at her, are seized by a chill of the unfathomable. They feel lost in the place, not understanding where they really are. In the midst of the silence, someone in the audience cannot hold back his words and says that this girl is the true embodiment of beauty. While the characters are discussing what happened, one of them says with a smile that the incident happened when the teacher briefly left the classroom for an evening meeting. At this time, the two girls, engrossed in their phones, realize that their devices are completely discharged. Some of the gathered notice that the floor on which they are standing is composed of dense clouds and begin to doubt the reality of all that is happening. The angel appeals to the heroes, urging them not to take everything for granted, for the demon king has been reborn and Fantasia is shrouded in threat. She urges our heroes to save the world. One of the girls, questioning herself, doubts the possibility of being transported to another world, but one of the boys, realizing that Fantasia does exist, confirms her doubts. At this time, the goddess addresses the heroes, explaining that they will be moved to one of Fantasia's temples, where they will be greeted by a saint entrusted to her. The saint will help them adjust to the world of Fantasia. One of the boys decides to question the goddess, asking permission. His request is met with a positive response. The boy's name is Ohanu, and he asks about the existence of levels, skills, and monsters, like in the games. The goddess confirms his hunch. After that, one of the girls, Zhang Mian, decides to ask her question to the goddess. She asks if Fantasia is decorated in medieval style, are there princes and knights? The goddess answers that they do exist. This insight arouses the girl's interest and enthusiasm. Then another guy, Choi Gangmin, decides to address his question to the goddess. He asks if either of them will become an outstanding hero. The goddess replies that they are not. In response, the guy assumes that they are all heroes, regardless of their abilities. The goddess clarifies that not all heroes have the same powers. They can become true heroes only after the recognition and patronage of several fantasy gods. The goddess answer inspires Choi Gangmin, and he thanks her for it. The goddess notices the guy's confidence and says she looks forward to his participation. Following this, one of the guys whispers to himself that this guy already has a special attitude. Frustration and jealousy encompasses everyone else, realizing that even the goddesses have taken notice of this guy. Then one of the girls, Eubora, asks her question. She introduces herself as the class president. The goddess kindly asks what her question is. The girl says she understands that this world is in danger and the gods desperately need their help, but the unexpected displacement will make their loved ones and teachers worried. She asks the goddess if the heroes will be able to contact them. The goddess replies that it will be difficult. The girl asks the next question, when can they return? The goddess answers that if the heroes defeat the demon king, the patron gods will grant their wishes. This provokes many questions from everyone else, and each of them exclaims, wanting to ask their own question to the goddess. After this we see the face of the goddess, calm but perceptive. Some say that the worried heroes keep piling questions on the goddess, and she answers sincerely, but with each question her answers get shorter and shorter. After the goddess finishes her speech, she asks if anyone else has any questions. Everyone becomes silent, as if captivated by her presence. However, the silence is interrupted by one of the guys. He raises his hand and modestly says that he has no questions, but only one request. He pleads with the goddess to bring him back to earth. The goddess replies that she has just made it clear, as soon as the heroes defeat the demon king, their wishes will be granted immediately. But the boy objects, saying that he does not aspire to become a hero, and therefore wishes that the goddess return him to earth immediately. For a moment, the goddess is silent, and the boy asks if she can't just bring him back. The goddess replies that of course it is possible, but that she wishes to ask him a question before doing so. The question is this, a world inhabited by countless lives is in danger of being destroyed. For what reason is the guy willing to turn his back on that world and return to ordinary life? The boy does not understand how he, who brings trouble to his family, can save the world? This brings contempt from those who stand beside him, and continuous silence from the goddess. After this moment, the silence is broken, and the goddess asks the boy's name. 
He answers that his name is Kong Hansu, and adds that it is the name his parents gave him after much deliberation. The goddess says that all those who do not wish to become brave must declare it now. But the faces of everyone present express confidence, and no one says anything. The goddess declares that they will not force anyone. The guy is confused by the fact that he is alone near the portal, ready to leave Fantasia. He asks seriously, is there no one else? The goddess replies that Kong Han's place is not in this gathering of great heroes, and it is time for him to leave them. He approaches the portal, and all his classmates ask him to say hello to their families. The guy replies that he's remembered them all and calls them disrespectful assholes. He then makes his way through the portal, promising to return first and see them all on earth. The next scene takes place in some woods. Kang Hansu realizes that he is far away from the school, which causes him some surprise. He doubts whether he is really on the ground. Suddenly the boy senses someone standing behind him, and he turns around and says that he is a little lost. But before he finishes his sentence, his eyes see an elfish girl in the arms of one of the three wolves. The wolves growl at the hero, and the girl lets out her last breath. This terror causes indescribable fear in Kong Hansu, and he does not understand what is happening. He utters the words, damn goddess. Then he is attacked by a pack of wolfhounds, shouting, meat, meat with short ears this time. The boy tries to run away and realizes that this world is not his home. The scene changes, and we find ourselves in the sacred city of Prologina. The characters move there, surrounded by a beautiful golden glow. The goddess solemnly greets our heroes. None of those gathered can determine whether she is another goddess or someone else, but all agree that she is also beautiful. Afterwards, the girls notice a handsome guy behind the goddess and try to figure out if he could be a prince or someone special. And one of the girls says that she is a servant of a great temple and was sent by the goddess to meet the heroes. She then introduces those present with radiant grace. The arena of Aloes, Lord of the Sword, sits to her left. The prince of this kingdom of dreamers possesses greatness, and his swordsmanship is unsurpassed. The young man expresses his sincere honor to meet the legendary heroes in person. This causes delight and confusion among the girls, and they realize that before them is indeed a true prince. Then one of the maids notices the maids and wonders why the princess is late. Suddenly two doors open, and the princess emerges, apologizing for her tardiness because she has consumed too much drink and overslept. The attendant observes that honesty is both a virtue and a flaw, and no clarification is needed. The princess admits her mistake, but is interrupted, stumbles, and falls to the floor. She reports that the floor of the temple is slippery, because she never slipped once on her way here. All the heroes stand in front of her, looking at the princess in amazement and admiration. Someone in the crowd says that she is a beauty, a princess cutie. This arouses the girl's amazement. And so, her name is Etna Archimage. She is the princess of the Archimage kingdom and mentor of brave wizards. The temple attendant announces this and specifies that the Archimage Kingdom is south of the temple. Then Ohanu opens the status window and exclaims happily about it. He tells his classmates that they all seem to be in math camp with famous idols. He explains that they can view their levels and skills at any time with this feature. Then he turns his gaze to his status window and sees the lines, patronage, curse, share. The hero notes that the patronage is generally understandable, but as for the rest, the hero decides to start by checking the patronage. He opens the tab and notices that the friendly race's language automatically translates, realizing how useful this is in many situations. Then he notices that the experience points gained during the hunt and achievements increase significantly, but he doesn't understand exactly how significantly. The hero realizes that this is some kind of supernatural effect, as there is no level limit here. The boy realizes that too many competitors have received the same patronage. As a result, he asks the priestess a question. He says that the goddess has said that they are to receive the patronage of the gods, and asks what it takes to do so. The girl replies that this is a great question. She says that heroes should come to taste the gods, though the standards of each god are different. Then the heroes begin to have messages about the actions of the gods. For example, some god scrutinizes the hero's bodies, another god looks rather sternly, and an innocent goddess wonders where they are looking, and so on. This causes the heroes to be perplexed. 
The servant girl explains that each god has different standards, but they are all looking for pieces of wood capable of ending the great demon king. The girl asks if this is enough as an answer. The hero replies that it is quite enough. The attendant assures the heroes that the gods are watching over them, but they must remember that the gods are not always interested. She also wishes the heroes to receive the patronage of the gods. Then one of the boys in glasses asks the minister what will happen if they don't receive patronage from any god. The minister answers with a satisfied smile, she doesn't have to worry about any garbage. Then our heroes are instantly teleported by a blue, bright glow to an unknown location and shown that their adventure in Fantasia is just beginning. The scene then returns to the guy who decides to leave Fantasia and still runs through the woods avoiding the horrible monsters. Exhausted by exhaustion, our hero finally finds refuge under a tree and, panting, admits to himself that he should have taken care of his physical form. Just then, as if out of nowhere, an arrow plunges into the tree. The hero looks back to see that the monsters are still chasing him. They curse him and shout, flesh, human flesh. The evil creatures order him to stay where he is. Inside himself, the boy realizes that such creatures simply do not exist here on earth. He realizes that the goddess has deceived him, with no intention of bringing him back. Kong Hansu feels hopeless and desperately tries to think of a way out. He realizes that if this is the world of Fantasia, there must be a miracle in it, some kind of magic, and he prays for it. Suddenly his characteristics appear before him. He reads the curse line with amazement. He reveals that line. It records his abilities, automatic translation of a hostile language and a significant decrease in the experience he receives during hunts and achievements. The hero realizes that the goddess is an evil force that decided to freeze him thoroughly, it was she who imposed these negative effects on him. The monsters tell the boy that they will eat him to the bone and make other threats. The guy realizes that if the hostile language automatically translates, he can make contact with these monsters. So he turns to the creatures and offers to solve everything by talking. The monsters stop in a stupor, looking at each other as if they were petrified. However, this approach proves futile and the monsters declare that they plan to eat lunch first and talk later. The guy realizes that even talking does not bring positive results. After running some more distance, the boy realizes that he is no longer able to keep running and decides to give up. The monsters surround him, and he silently turns to his parents, asking their forgiveness, for he will be the first to leave because of this cursed goddess. But suddenly the hero hears a voice, but cannot make out the words. Suddenly an arrow hits his leg. Fairies appear in front of him and want to kill him, but then switch to monsters, and the hero decides to run away while they fight. Exhausted by the pain, the hero sits down near the tree. He does not know what to do. Thoughts of prayer flicker in his mind, but he realizes that it is because of the goddess that he is here. He sees an arrow in his leg, feeling a fiery pain. The boy realizes that it is better to die than to pray to such an imperfect god. And then he notices an invisible girl watching him. The guy can't believe that the only thing left for him is death. Then a notice appears that some god is watching him intently. The hero is still contemplating praying to the god, but decides he will not do so, for he is here because of the god. Suddenly he hears the words of the goddess following him. She says that a man named Kong Hansu has chosen death instead of turning to the gods. Then a warning appears in the notice that some god is cautiously approaching him. The hero understands nothing, but begs the girl to save him. And it turns out that his body responded to the unfamiliar voice before his mind did. Then a notice appears in which this goddess asks the hero why he is alone. The hero answers that he is here because of the cursed goddess. He was living peacefully on earth, in civilization, and she took him away. But he cannot tell the truth. The hero realizes that if this mysterious voice also belongs to a god, he may be an ally of the goddess. The boy tells the goddess to save him first, for he is dying of pain. After that, a notice appears that some god has been delayed in thinking. The hero then asks himself if there might happen to be another god here to help him. The goddess replies that the hero is strange, and mutters that there can be no other gods here, which she likes. The hero makes the assumption that this goddess is Asa, but she does not understand what it means. The hero wonders how to explain it. The guy internally reasons that Asa essentially represents loneliness, exile from the collective. However, if he explains his position in this way, 
he might be given another strange nickname. Therefore, the guy needs to make something up. The young man tells the goddess that in general Asif means a lone wolf wandering the wasteland. This meaning of the word Asif pleases the goddess. Inside himself, the hero is glad that his deception worked. Following this, the goddess begins to feel more certain, she is certain of her true nature, Asa. The hero asks the goddess to save him, as it were. Determined, however, the goddess enthusiastically asks the hero if he, too, is an Asa. But inside himself, the boy wonders how he can be an ass. Although his friends in his class have a complete lack of reverence for their elders, he is the antonym of Asa, or Ensa. The boy never calls himself Asa but suddenly tells the goddess that he, too, is Asa. He reveals that all of his companions were called to the temple, but he separated from them and ended up here. Inside himself, the hero realizes that pride can be sacrificed for the sake of revenge and survival. Then the hero is notified that the goddess is pondering whether to help poor Asa, and she hesitates, remembering the bitter past. But the boy interrupts the goddess's musings and tells her that everyone knows that asses should help each other, whether you are human or god. The guy understands that it's all made up as he goes along, and it probably sounds ridiculous. However, he doesn't understand how you can be an outsider when you have a friend willing to help. The goddess then declares with a determined face that there is no way Asa will die, and begins to conjure to heal him. Suddenly a multitude of bright green light enters the boy's wound, and his murderous pain instantly disappears. The boy realizes that before him is indeed a god. The young man thanks the goddess for saving him and feels his body become lighter. The goddess looks at him with pride. The hero pays attention to his stats and sees that the god Asa has become his patron. He clicks on this ability and sees its description, Asa resets all states except death, and if the lone wolf leaves the wasteland, terrible things happen. The hero understands that the made-up expression has taken on a broad meaning. However, he also does not understand what the last point of ability means. He assumes that if he becomes Zinsu, he will be punished. The goddess then categorically declares that she only helps Asa. The hero, for the most part, does not object, for because of the curse of the brave man he cannot communicate with the others anyway. The hero realizes that even though he understands the speech of these monsters, fate has still imposed the role of outsider on him. The guy then begins to run away from the monsters with a determined expression on his face, and the monsters chase him calling him meat. After a while of running, the guy notices that Asa has reset all of his states. He realizes that this ability affects not only his wounds, but also all the effects, and so he stops feeling tired. The hero realizes that even running at top speed does not tire him out. He also realizes that these monsters are already exhausted and will not be able to catch up with him. Suddenly, however, one of the monsters throws a stone at the hero, telling him that the meat must not escape, and it hits right on target. The hero is then notified that the goddess is watching him with a restless heart. But fortunately, the stone has no effect, which causes great surprise to the confident monsters. They cannot understand how it is that their already defeated meat escapes again. The hero earnestly tells the goddess that this is simply unbelievable. Running away from the relentless monsters, our hero realized that not only was he free of wounds and fatigue, but in the cruelest of environments he manages to remain calm. Perhaps, if he does get caught, he means to bite off his tongue, but with such a serene frame of mind, the guy might decide to take such an extreme step. Then the goddess answers the hero, rejoicing that it will not ruin him. The hero ironically thanks the girl for this bleak prospect. But then the hero realizes that the goddess is able to reset all states except death. It means that if the hero dies from a single blow, even the critical state will reset. Looking at the cliff, he decides to run to it. The goddess happily informs the hero that if he jumps, he will surely die. The hero makes a remark about the god's heartlessness, sarcastically of course. He suggests that the goddess give him wings, in which case. Finally, the monsters catch up with the hero. The guy realizes that there is a god beside him, not too experienced, and there is a cliff ahead and monsters behind. Him. And this is the moment of choice for the hero. He begins a conversation with the monsters. He informs them that he has a useful suggestion. He says that there are too many hungry mouths and too little meat. So he offers the tastiest parts of his body to whoever catches it first. 
Then the camera changes perspective, and we hear his words from a different angle. He says that instead of sharing it with everyone, you should give it to just one, the first one to catch it. Immediately, the monsters attack him. Two of them seem to manage to reach the hero first, and an argument begins between them about who caught him first. The boy realizes that these monsters have become attached to him because they love his meat, and so he himself does not mind getting attached to them. He grabs one of the monsters and, along with the rest of them, falls off the cliff. The monsters exclaim that this is crazy meat, they don't understand what the guy is doing, and the hero begins to laugh. And together they reach the ground. When the hero opens his eyes, the first thing he realizes is that he is not dead. He realizes that his body seems to have shrunk, but this is most likely just an illusion. Then he uses the ability and all effects are removed. The hero gets up, and the goddess admires his stamina. Guy notices that one of the monsters has survived after all and pulls out his dagger, shouting that the hero is his dinner. Guy sees that his opponent's name is Meat Cutter of the Blue Moon, his level 3, and there are no patronage or curses. The hero realizes that he is able to see other people's statuses and compliments the monster's name. He also notices that the monster's level is much higher than his own. The guy assumes that even without patronage the monster survived the fall from such a height, and concludes that it is all thanks to his level. The hero says to himself that in the world of fantasy role-playing games the level is usually raised with experience points. At this time he picks up a stone from the ground and says that if the opponent is stronger and higher in level, he will be given much more experience for his victory. After which, apparently, he kills the monster. But events carry over to the other characters. The servant girl tells them that patronage and cursing are two ways to become stronger. She explains that heroes can gain experience points by killing creatures with a status window and thus increase their level. And it is also possible to gain the occupation of the gods. One of the guys yawns and says that he is sorry to spend so much time getting the gods patronage. The other guy mentally asks the gods to give him patronage, for he is the talent the gods are looking for. The servant girl reminds the heroes that receiving patronage is not everything, for the gods will always be watching over them. Raising her hand, she asks a question. The girl asks if the gods are watching them around the clock or not. The servant girl answers that they are, as she said earlier. This brings shame to some of the girls. The servant girl tells the heroes to remember that the gods are not human beings, and they should not be put on the same level as ordinary mortals. Soon the girl opened her stats and found that she had received patronage. She was infinitely surprised and delighted. Her joy was so great that she was literally jumping for joy. However, this caused surprise and perhaps envy in the others. Suddenly the guy with the glasses wondered what this skill had to do with killing the demon king. Suddenly, he smelled a scent of. The girl who received the patronage began to pose gracefully, demonstrating her ability to charm, an attractive scent always emanated from her body, and her ability to control the hearts of the opposite sex increased significantly. However, the minister asked the girl to stop and return to her seat. The girl apologized, but her arrogance prevented her from doing so, and she did not know how to stop her pride. Then the humble goddess declared that she hated arrogant behavior. The servant girl reported that it was too late. The girl did not understand what she meant, and said that the minister was probably referring to all the men who had submitted to her charms. But the minister asked the girl to look again at her status. The girl opened her status and saw the curse there. She exclaimed, not understanding its meaning. She assured herself that they were heroes, how could? They have a curse and suggested that perhaps some demon had appeared. With a triumphant smile on her face, the attendant explained to the haughty girl that the gods can not only patronize, but also curse heroes who are not to their liking. The girl replied that she had never heard of it. The attendant remarked that, of course, the girl had not heard about it before, for the attendant was only now about to tell her about it. Then some sign appeared on the girl's back, and she suddenly felt pain. The abilities of this curse of condemnation are shown, all the damage and scathing criticism received is greatly increased, and every time a girl shows arrogance, she is severely condemned. Because of this, the girl realized she was wrong and begged for the curse to be lifted. In response, the attendant told the heroes to remember it all. The girl received reports of some humble goddess continuing to watch over her, the wind spirit whistled, 
and the male god pretended that nothing was happening. The attendant added that the patronage and the curse accompany the heroes until death. As their level increases, their effect intensifies, and when they reach a certain level, they can no longer get rid of it. The girl said that the Ephraim curse was hurting her terribly, and this would probably be the end of her. At this time, the princess asked the girl not to give up. The princess explained that the curse could be compensated by patronage. When a girl raises her level, her body and soul will become stronger and her pain will be lessened. The girl asked the question, encouraged a little. The princess assured her that this was indeed the case, and so the girl and the rest of the heroes should not give up so easily. Events then return to the lonely guy, and a picture unfolds before us, his stone is finally covered in blood, and he removes the blood stains from his face himself. The guy says that killing the monster had no effect on his level, and this causes him some anxiety. The hero wonders how he was able to deal with monsters beyond his level, and comes to the assumption that it may be due to either some kind of curse or the difficulty of leveling up in general. Addressing the goddess, he calls her as a lone wolf and asks if she can share any useful information. The goddess replies that the hero should call her Asa. The hero addresses her with the nickname Asa and repeats his question. The goddess firmly declares that she cannot teach him anything. The boy realizes that there is no other benefit besides the patronage of the goddess, but the only benefit that the hero is very fond of is that she is by his side. Thus, he has to endure. And together the heroes continue to run on through the forest. The goddess tells the hero that she's bored of just running, and the boy replies that so is he. It flashed through his mind that they've been rushing through the woods for hours, but despite this, he has no thirst and no headache, and he feels no fatigue. Suggesting to the hero to do something else, the goddess gets the answer that if they find a human. But before he can finish his sentence, the guy notices monsters. The monsters smell human flesh and blood, and the hero realizes that even under the cliff is full of man-eating monsters. At this time, the goddess hopes that the weak hero will die painlessly, but the hero replies to himself that if the goddess were around, he would fix her chattering mouth. Then the hero raises the dagger in his hand, and the monsters begin to sniff, sensing that the hero is somewhere near. Looking confidently forward, the hero intends to launch an attack. The monsters keep searching for the hero, relentlessly wanting to eat him, but not knowing where he is. The hero, looking at his dagger, realizes that it is probably only for poking. However, since its previous owner bore the loud name cutter, his knife cannot be plain and ordinary. At this time, the goddess prays for the hero's peace of mind. But the hero, with a contemptuous expression on his face, announces that he is not going to die at all. Then the hero says that this world is a fantasy world, but no one says to rely only on magic or swordsmanship and so he makes a weapon of rope and stone, a kind of symbol of power. At this time, the goddess is watching him aloof. In addition to the weapon itself, the hero makes a scabbard of rope. He also asks the goddess if she has heard of centrifugal force. The guy begins to spin the stone and says he will show the fantasy monsters the power of science. The hero accelerates the stone to tremendous speed, but realizes he lacks stamina and applies his ability. The hero says that every time his ability is triggered, the trembling in his legs disappears, his breathing becomes calm, and so the guy begins to understand how to use the patronage. He doesn't have to worry about minor wounds and fatigue. At this time, the monsters are already approaching, preparing to attack. The guy realizes that the only thing he needs to avoid is instant death, and otherwise the patronage itself heals him. And then he strikes one of the monsters with an insanely hard rock. And the hero realized that he is capable of beating at the edge of his power, as long as it does not threaten death. Monsters, believing that their power would soon run out. The boy realizes that the monsters have decided to stall for time to exhaust him. The hero recognizes their cunning and wonders how they think much better than he anticipated. The monsters notice that the guy has stopped twisting the rope and think he's exhausted, so they decide to launch a joint attack. But they are out of luck. The hero decides that sneakiness must be met with instant sneakiness, and, using his patronizing ability, fights his enemies with their own weapons. The hero towers over the bodies of the fallen monsters. The goddess notes that her appreciation of him has increased only slightly. The boy says that he has squeezed all their juices out of the monsters. The boy notices that one monster has survived and tells him not to move, 
warning that any disobedience will bring him pain. Then he anxiously considers that asking such a question might be futile, for the monster might lie. The guy's words cause amazement in the eyes of the monster, who does not understand how meat can talk. He points his hand in the direction of the place where people live. The hero realizes that even if the monster is lying, it is possible to catch other monsters, thus increasing the accuracy of the information. The guy then asks the monster the name of their race. The monster mockingly asks if he is a fool, to which the hero replies that if the monster doesn't want his skull pierced, he better answer the question. The monster calls his race nulls and begs for mercy, for he has answered all the questions. The boy thanks the monster and finishes him off, saying that he said he wouldn't hurt him, but he didn't say anything about leaving him alive. The beautiful goddess then turns to the young lad, informing him that he is facing an all. The boy, however, confidently replies that he has already found out for himself. At the same time, he notes that the gnolls he saw in the games look much nicer. This observation makes our hero wonder why these creatures evoke positive emotions in the games. He suggests that this could be due to the difference between 2D and 3D graphics, or a problem in the creativity of the developers. However, if the problem is not with the developers, but with the realization that the gnolls are trying to kill it, then this presents another difficulty. The next event we witness is the introduction of the gnolls. Gnolls are two-legged monsters, half-human half-beasts. They often appear in the fantasy world, and after being introduced in TRPG they were often made to look like hyenas. The goddess then informs the boy that the baby gnolls look adorable. The boy thanks the goddess for the seemingly useless and unnecessary information provided. However, our hero notices that despite the fact that he has already destroyed a significant number of these monsters, his level has not changed. Events then take us to the temple to the other heroes. The prince announces that full training for all heroes will begin tomorrow. The prince tells us that he is in charge of swordsmanship, while Princess Etna is in charge of magic. Our heroes, in turn, can choose one of two directions. Then the boy asks the prince about the possibility of learning both swordsmanship and magic at the same time. The prince answers in the affirmative, explaining that if the heroes find it difficult, they can abandon their chosen path at any time. The hero confidently declares that this will not happen, and the prince, relying on his words, expresses his faith in him. Then the other guy asks the prince if it is possible to give up both swordsmanship and magic. The prince replies that magic and swordsmanship are the best disciplines on the continent of Fantasia, but if the hero doesn't need it, there's no problem. Next, this character asks the prince about the possibility of leaving the temple in his spare time from training, to which he receives an affirmative answer. The prince asks the boy if he has any more questions, and the boy replies that there are no more questions. After that, a certain carefree spirit shows a clear interest in this guy. Then we get a closer acquaintance with him. He sits on his bed and is lost in thought. In his thoughts, the guy scoffs at the training, considering it a mass for those who do not have cheat skills. He believes that he, as the protagonist of the fantasy world, has his own unique path to follow. In his imagination, the boy imagines himself next to beautiful women and tells his classmates to keep tormenting themselves in their training, while he, as the protagonist of the fantasy world, will explore ruins and labyrinths in the company of charming companions. Then our hero chuckles wickedly. Finally, the next morning arrives. The prince raises his hand to attract attention and asks the heroes who wish to become knights to follow him. He also points out that the heroes can always change their minds if swordsmanship suddenly doesn't suit them. The puzzled boy then asks the prince a question about magic and asks where they will be taught magic, since the princess is not present. The prince replies that the princess had a little too much to drink last night, but that she is responsible and will arrive soon. Then the prince tells everyone who wants to master magic to wait. After that, we hear a dialogue about how someone hasn't slept well and that the bathroom is bad here, and even the shampoo is missing. Afterwards, the very hero who considers himself the protagonist of the fantasy world opens his stats and sees that he has gained patronage. This event arouses his surprise. As a reminder, the guy's name is Ohanu, and he reveals his unusual patronage, called Uniqueness. In his hands lie two amazing abilities. First, Ohanu has the most unique destiny in the whole world. And second, only he is able to see and feel this special favor. With a serious expression on his face, 
The boy accepts this answer and feels sincere joy. Then El Hanu turns to Choi Kongman and realizes that he knows absolutely nothing, and he continues to think he is excellent. With humor in his voice, the guy wished Choi would keep trying hard. And then the hero goes down the stairs and inwardly tells Choi that even with the best of efforts, he can only take the position of the protagonist's adversary. After a while, the boy arrives in the city of the Great Temple, in the beautiful Prolegen Square, and realizes that he has come to just the right address. With the chant that all fantastic adventures begin here, the boy opens the door. Greeting him, the girl notices that this is clearly his first time here, and asks what purpose he decided to visit the mercenary guild. Ohanu firmly declares that he wants to join the ranks of mercenaries. We are then told that becoming a mercenary is an inevitable path chosen by all main characters in the fantasy genre. The boy is then approached by a red-haired girl who grudgingly tells Ohan that this is not a place for green newcomers. She urges the boy to return to his homeland, telling him of the many young men who have died as mercenaries like Ohan because of their indiscretion. The guy turns to the girl and stares at her silently, totally perplexed. We see the effect of patronage, called protagonist's corrections. Then the girl, seeing that the guy is just silent and does not answer anything, decides to find out if he is listening to her at all. In his mind, the guy realizes that this enchanting beauty is a mercenary. He assumes that she is probably a princess or the daughter of an aristocrat who is hiding her true identity. Ohanu realizes that this is his fate as the protagonist, for this is undoubtedly the effect of patronage. After that, the hero finally decides to answer the girl. The boy says that he does not wish to return, which upsets the girl a bit, and she asks him if he meant what he said. Ohanu replies that if she cares so much about him, why don't they become allies? Afterwards, the guy says that judging by looks alone is a bad habit, and expresses his belief that the girl has often encountered this. He asks her if she agrees with his opinion. Sadness appears on the girl's face, and she says that the guy surprised her. Then Ohanu begins to rejoice that he was right about his uniqueness. Ohanu tells the girl that he cannot yet reveal all his cards, but admits to her that he has been chosen. The girl utters with an astonished face, unbelievable. The boy realizes that on earth he has trouble even talking to such a beautiful woman, but here he becomes a hero who saves the world. Suddenly the boy receives a notification that some joker god has laughed himself to tears with laughter. The girl then asks the hero about his special abilities. The boy replies that he is about to demonstrate to her what the protagonist's corrections are. The girl asks him what it is. After that, events are transported to the lonely hero. We see the guy slaying several monsters again. One of them still resists death in pain, but through this agony he finds the Strength to tell the guy that the village of men is not in the west, but somewhere far away. Our hero begins to twist his stone on a rope, but the monster, despite his pain, recognizes that the guy is too strong, and reveals the truth to him, for dishonesty against such a strong guy would be foolishness. After these words, the boy thanks the monster for the useful information and, realizing that there is no need to leave him in agony any longer, finishes him off. Inwardly he realizes that these monsters, despite their danger, have amazing honesty, and their lies sound so false that they can be recognized immediately. In the next scene, the hero, shielding his eyes from the sun, looks into the distance and realizes that the human village is to the west, although the exact distance is unknown. The boy pulls the knolls at length, and there can be no mistake. He begins to remember how he destroyed these monsters time after time and realizes that as his victories increased, the battle with them turned into an ordinary hunt. In one day he has become a regular hunter, and the hero wonders if this is his hidden talent. But he quickly answers to himself that this is no hidden talent. In the process of mastering the hunt, he suffered many mortal wounds, and had it not been for Asa's patronage, he would never have mastered combat so quickly. In addition, the hero easily manages to remain calm even in the most dangerous situations. He realizes that even with so many mortal wounds, he is not insane. The hero then wonders how far it is to the village, for he is eager to meet the natives of this fantasy world. Then the goddess, muttering, what a pity, gets his attention. The boy asks the goddess if she is still waiting for him to die, to which she replies that she does not care. The hero observes that she is too heartless for someone who has granted him patronage. Suddenly the hero is attacked by a knoll from behind. 
But with ease the boy pulls a dagger from its sheath and pierces the monster. But it doesn't end with one monster. Several more arrive. The hero notices that no matter how many of them he kills, they don't run out. After that, the hero finally manages all the other monsters. Having opened the statistics, the hero sees that his level is still not rising, and he questions the goddess about it. The goddess begins to worry. Suddenly the hero begins to hear voices, but he does not understand what they are saying. He hears the untranslatable language of a friendly race. The boy decides to hide behind a tree and assumes that it is the elves again. He decides to sneak a peek at who is really there. In his mind, he realizes that the elves easily pierced the poor man who was being chased by monsters with an arrow, and the concept of a friendly race may be different from his usual understanding. Then the hero begins to peek at the conversations and sees three people, two male swordsmen and one female archer. He wonders if they are mercenaries. After that, the hero notices a girl throwing a shuriken in his direction, but hitting a tree. The people begin to say something, but the hero does not understand their words. The guy comes out of hiding and explains to the people that he is looking for the village. However, he realizes that they do not understand a word. Then the hero decides to hide his dagger, kneel down, and raise his hands, showing that he is peaceful. He says that he surrenders and is against violence. The hero understands that the language barrier will not disappear by itself, but people communicate in more than just words. There is body language and a friendly voice that he will use to make contact with these people. The hero goes on to realize that although they cannot communicate through words, they can communicate their desires through actions. The hero's actions confuse people, and the girl decides to take aim at the guy with her crossbow. But someone stops her, telling her that the man is not a threat and is kind. Then people decide to band together, and now the four of them are going somewhere. People start talking, but the hero doesn't understand their words. Then the girl says the guy's name, and everyone else picks it up. This causes confusion for the hero because he does not understand anything. Kang Hansu tells us that he used hand and foot gestures to explain his name to them. He can't make out a single word except his name, and the second foreign language in his school always lowered his grade point average. Khan is glad that he met friendly people, at least they didn't start out familiar with the Bao like the elves do. But most importantly, now he is not so afraid to face monsters. Although the hero does not see the statistics of these people, the heavily armed mercenaries clearly outnumber his first level. This causes great displeasure to the goddess. She abruptly notices that the hero does not act like Asa. The hero simply mutters something under his breath. The goddess tells the hero not to answer carelessly. Khan replies that when you get close to people, the manner of communication becomes easier. The goddess replies to the hero that he should not pretend to be close to these people. After that, the boy realizes that although he has met these people, he has no one to talk to but the goddess. But thanks to body language, he remembers their names. This charming man with the hair is Giri, apparently the leader of the group. He rushes forward easily with his huge, brutal sword, and it seems to be enough to overpower any fantastic monster. This is the man's muscles and wonders about his incredible strength. At this time, the goddess smiles. Then the other guy called the hero over to him and hugged him, laughing. His name is Kal. Kal is smaller than Gary, but he has a strong and sturdy build, and he laughs all the time. There are swords hanging on either side of his waist, and the hero realizes that Kal looks like a typical fantasy hero. After a while, there comes a moment when the girl begins to speak her mind, and Khan, calling her by her name, admits that he doesn't quite understand her. The girl answered to the name Misa. She was one of the riflemen in their group, using a huge steel crossbow whose size clearly indicated that it was not meant for humans. Misa points forward, and the hero, aware that he should pay attention, turns his gaze there. As he looks into the distance, he notices two columns of smoke. This type of sign leads him to believe that, if it is not a mountain fire, the smoke is probably coming from the houses. This circumstance inspires the hero, confirming his hunch that there are people in that direction. Meanwhile, the goddess turns to the guy and admonishes him for not behaving as he should by calling him out like this. The hero responds only yes, yes in return. Her disappointment does not go unnoticed, and she stares at the hero in displeasure. The hero explains that he was just pretending to be close to her in order to leave the forest. 
Suddenly, however, all the people are looking at him in displeasure. Immediately they find themselves attacked by a horde of monsters. The monsters scream, demanding that the humans provide them with their bones and meat. At that moment, one of the men exclaims Khan's name. The hero reports that there are a whole horde of monsters here, and this is the first time they have been attacked by such a crowd, which leads him to assume that these monsters are lurking here in ambush. Suddenly, the hero's friends stand in front of him, ready to protect him. They decide to attack the monsters, and the battle begins. Gary and Call decide to attack together, while the monsters, in turn, decide to split up and attack at random. Call and Gary destroy several of the monsters. The gnolls surround the boys and threaten to attack until they are exhausted. One of the monsters warns that if any of the men take an extra step, they will feel pain. Suddenly several monsters decide to attack the hero, but Misa saves him by firing an arrow straight into the face of one of them. She begins to reload her crossbow cannon. Suddenly, a monster attacks her from behind, but the hero manages to warn her and protect it with his dagger. However, the dagger is too small to do much damage to the big monster. At this point, the goddess begins to feel uncomfortable, and the hero asks her to close her eyes before he begins to explain that man is a social being and these people need his help. While the hero is talking about this, he looks toward the goddess and the monster decides to attack him, but the hero easily dodges and strikes the monster. The other monsters express surprise and notice that this little guy turns out to be strong. The hero inwardly thinks that the monsters themselves have gathered to his first level. Finally, the heroes defeat all the monsters, and the hero notes that it's a good thing everyone is unharmed. But suddenly the hero's friends get in front of him, and Misa starts pointing her crossbow at the guy. The hero doesn't understand what's going on and asks Misa if she's joking, because he tried so hard not to let the gnolls catch them. This brings a smile to Misa's face, and, singing along, she fires an arrow that hits the hero just above his chest. The hero falls to the ground and asks himself what the hell kind of fantasy world this is. Then we hear a conversation between the hero's companions. Call tells Misa that she did a great job. Call says that things didn't go according to plan because of the gnolls, but Misa replies that it's actually even better. After all, the surprise attack made them realize how dangerous Khan is. The boys realized that our hero was initially trembling in a way that they thought was weak. In addition, Khan spoiled the whole mood with his incomprehensible chatter. However, the hero turned out to be far more combat ready than they had anticipated. Gary states that they might have been in danger if they had stuck to their original plan. After this, Call expresses some frustration, but admits that the situation is not amenable to change. Call also notes that our hero would never sell himself into slavery. Then Gary offers to take back the dagger the hero walked with. Call replies that this is pointless, since the dagger is worthless anyway. Gary argues that even if they can't sell Kana into slavery, they can still make money on the dagger, and who knows, maybe the dagger will turn out to be valuable. After this, Call and Misa exchange glances. Gary asks his friends why they don't believe him again. He caught a glimpse of the jewel on the dagger. It belongs to the royal family of elves. This astonishes Call, and he decides to go over and seriously examine the dagger, asking Gary if it is true. Gary replies that even if it is a quality fake, you can get a lot of money for it. Gary then asks Call to hurry, as the gnolls may attack again. They are already exhausted and will not be able to go through another battle. Finally, Call approaches the hero and begins to examine him. He notices that the guy doesn't let go of his weapon, even to the point of death. Misa tells Call to be careful, because she shot the guy in the chest but didn't hit his heart. And it's possible that Khan is still alive. Call draws his sword from its sheath and tries to stab the guy. But before he can do so, he sees the hero's stats in front of him, which opens up before his eyes. We are told that to see a character's status, there are two conditions, either the opponent voluntarily shares it, or it can be spied on with a special patronage. But the main condition is that the opponent must be alive. Realizing that the boy is still alive, Cole tells the others that the boy. But before he can finish his sentence, Khan stabs him in the neck with his dagger. This causes great surprise to Misa and Giri. Call begins to choke, making appropriate noises. Misa and Jerry shout Call's name. The hero stands before them, full of confidence and rage, ready to kill them both. 
The girl and the man do not understand who this hero is. Jerry realizes that the sword is too heavy for him, and he spent too much strength in the previous battle. Suddenly Ken attacks Jerry, easily overcoming his resistance. Now only Nisa is left. She hits the hero in the chest with the second shot, but he is completely indifferent to this pain thanks to his ability. The hero takes the arrow out of his chest and looks at Nisa with crazy eyes, saying something. The magnificent hero turns to the beautiful Nisa, but his words are lost in the depths of misunderstanding. The regret-filled girl so kindly asks for forgiveness, having realized her mistake. But the hero, stubbornly holding a grudge, is unable to make her this gift. The pleading Nisa, falling to her knees before the hero, appeals to him for mercy. The hero speaks words that penetrate her heart, but she is unable to understand them. The only thing she is aware of is the imminent threat of death. And yet she continues to beg for mercy, but it is too late. The hero then removes his usual clothes and tries on his former friend's outfits, noting that taking arrows to the chest from such a huge crossbow is no small torment. He puts on his armor and attire, realizing how uncomfortable they are, and assuming that the reason is because of their feminine size. Looking at himself, the confident hero concludes that it is all awkward and inappropriate, for he is not comfortable with women's equipment. This is where the goddess seems to sprawl with an unbelievable laugh. She also shows her respect for the hero and his hobbies. However, Khan replies that. These are far from being hobbies, and of all those present only Nisa is similar to him in physique, while Kal and Giri's equipment looks clumsy and cumbersome. After grasping the crossbow in his hands, the hero realizes that he can use it, and decides to keep the weapon for future battles. The hero also realized that he had never been able to figure out the reason for their attack. At the end, Nisa's statute flashed, but only for a moment. Her level reached 6, and her patronage was called straight to target. Although she wasn't a hero herself, she had a patronage too. This surprised the hero. It turns out that in this world getting the patronage of a god was quite common. Then we were shown what constituted Nisa's patronage, she greatly increased the accuracy of hitting the target, regardless of the chosen method, and also the more often the target moved, the lower was the percentage of hitting, regardless of the chosen method. The goddess then told the hero that it was none of his business and asked where he was going next. Khan replied that he planned to go to the village as planned. Taking the bag of money he had taken from his former comrades, he went to the village and declared that even if he was not understood in the village, this money would help him get out somehow. The goddess also reminded the hero of how he had just tried to get rid of the rank of Asa, but failed. The hero replied that perhaps he should. Finally, events returned to Khan's classmates. The princess finally came to class and apologized to her heroes for being late. She promised that she would try very hard to make up for her tardiness. The princess first decided to explain what magic was all about. She excitedly told me that long ago, magic did not exist on the continent of Fantasia. However, before she could finish talking about where it came from, she was suddenly interrupted by a boy. He told his friends that magic came from conquest. He had read about it in a novella, and also claimed that, if mathematical calculations were properly applied, one could become a great magician. One of the guys stated that he knew this day would come, so he was saving his virginity. The other guy asked if he really cherished it on purpose. At this point, the other girl called the guys unworthy. She explained that magic is chemistry, and she would show them the best nuclear magic in the fantasy world. After that, the headmaster asked everyone to be quiet, for they were disturbing those who were trying to concentrate on the lesson. The boy realized that the headmaster didn't get into fantasy and suggested that you can't become a great magician just by learning the history of magic by heart. The guy said that magic was a talent, and you had to have an aptitude for mana. This displeased the girl. Finally, the princess interrupted everyone. She said that she didn't like useless theory either, and, of course, it was best to have talent. However, since talent is a very important factor, she insisted on explaining the origin of magic. The boys did not understand what she was talking about and began to ask each other questions. The princess went on and said that magic is a teaching in which talent is most important. Talent is determined by heredity and the knowledge received at school, at this time she showed how fire from the hands. And the girl asked everyone not to forget that. The princess said that the most important thing in magic is talent, 
it is defined by family ties and educational connections. The girl introduced herself as Etna the Archimage, a direct descendant of Cheyenne the Archimage, the twelfth apprentice and third husband of the founder. She had an innate heritage as well as knowledge. After that, the guy in the crowd asked, what about them? The princess said that she would train them, and if they became her students, they could achieve high potential. The girl then raised her hand and asked the princess if she could ask a question. The girl asked if a person could become a magician if he had no family connections or educational connections. And she asked how important that was. After all, they would be under the guidance of a great mentor. Overwhelmed by amazement and then transfixed by inspiration, the princess utters, yes, it is possible. Taking the girl by the hand, she informs her that they will discuss it all later, and the first step. She decides to establish a connection between herself, Yubara, and the teacher. Suddenly, bizarre purple and pink runes appear behind the princess and the girl. The princess declares Yubara the first apprentice of Archimage Etienne. This causes surprise and bewilderment to all present. The princess then summons Yubaru to swear an oath on magic. The girl is a little confused as to what this is all about, and asks, swear. And the runes slowly disappear. The princess congratulates Yubaru. From this moment on, she becomes a worthy mage. Surprise and joy cover the girl. Now we are introduced to Yubara's status. She possesses the power of magic. The princess also says that those who become her disciples first will inherit more talent. Yubara realizes that their apprentice-mentor relationship has just begun to take shape, and the patronage has already reached the rank of C. The girl asks the princess if this is the talent she spoke of, and receives a positive answer. Now we are presented with the talent of Yubora's magic. It is she, as the most precious person in the world, who bestows dreams and hopes, and can pass them on to her descendants and disciples. The girl realizes that it is impossible to become a magician if there are no parents or mentors with magic. The princess asks the girl if she now understands why talent is so important. The girl answers in the affirmative. Now the princess returns to their first question. Raising her hand, from which fire emanates, the girl tells them that the founder became a goddess of magic and left a patronage so that her descendants and disciples could easily master magic. The girl then shows a huge pillar of magical fire, demonstrating that with patronage you can use the white magic that ordinary magicians possess. This causes great amazement to all present. The princess then shows another form of magic. She has a flame in one hand and a purple glow in the other. This glow destroys the glove on the princess's hand. Everyone looks on in horror and begins to panic. The princess revisits the question of the need for talent. She explains that in her right hand is magic, which she uses with patronage, and in her left hand is dark magic, which she uses without patronage. Then one of the maids approaches the princess and begins to tickle her affectionately, saying that her majesty has strictly forbidden the princess to use dark magic. The princess replies that she only used it to explain to the heroes, such an answer does not please the maid. She then threatens to tell the truth to the queen. The princess admits her mistake and asks the woman not to pass this information on to her mother. Then a magician approaches the princess and begins to use magic to heal the princess' arm. Yubora approaches the princess and apologizes, saying that she was wrong to ask the question. The princess comforts her by saying that it is no big deal, the important thing is that they have learned how dangerous dark magic is. Someone in the crowd asks what this magic is, whether it is an evil force. The princess explains that dark magic is not something bad, but unlike the magical patronage sent by the founder, dark magic is simply the natural force of magic. The girl says that dry wood is needed to start the fire, and that her left hand nearly acted as that wood. The boy thanks her and says that in general terms everything is clear. Finally events return to Kana as he enters the village, and one of the guards, holding out his hand, addresses a question to him. The noble fellow does not hesitate to give him a few silver coins. As he walks through the streets of the town, the hero notices that armed men are wary everywhere. He assumes that this is because the village is located in a forest inhabited by dangerous man-eating monsters. Arriving at a certain house, the hero notices a sign and realizes that it has something to do with what he has just been told. The hero goes inside and proceeds to wash, uttering the words that money is the most beautiful thing in the world. 
He realizes that even despite the language barrier, people can become friends, whether with the guards or the innkeeper, or even with everyone he meets along the way. Suddenly the goddess expresses her discomfort and anxiety. The hero is surprised and replies that he too feels uncomfortable, especially while washing. He then asks the goddess if she is female. In response, the goddess becomes even more anxious. Determined to protect his self-esteem, the hero decides to assume that the goddess is a man. He continues to erase the blood trail, but notices that it does not disappear in any way. Suddenly the goddess begins to feel uneasy, and the guy, wondering what is bothering her, gets the answer that it is a secret. Then it occurs to him that this room. From behind the door comes a conversation that the hero understands. Someone says that he will sort it out himself, as he is the head. The hero observes silently, but suddenly says that he is still washing up and asks to wait a minute. A voice from behind the door says that he has been told that the guy does not understand the language, but he decides to believe it and agrees to wait. Khan gets dressed, dagger in hand, and realizes that there is a man behind the door who understands his speech. Remembering his curse, he realizes that it is not just any human, but a hostile race. Thus, the hero hopes that no gnoll or demon is waiting for him behind the door. He unlocks the door, sits on the bed, hiding the dagger beneath him, and invites whoever is behind the door to enter. A voice from behind the door asks for forgiveness. A curiosity arises in the hero's mind as to which monster is about to appear. Regardless of whether the race is friendly or hostile, it is important that the hero be able to have a constructive dialogue with this person. Finally, the man enters the room. The boy asks the man why he is here. The man assures the hero that he has nothing to fear, for he is the head of the village. He explains that he has been informed of the arrival of a traveler who does not speak their language and has come to check on the situation. The hero ponders trying to figure out who this man really is, and suggests that he is hiding his true identity, for he is too young to be an elder. The man says the guy's name and notices that it sounds strange. The hero is not surprised that the man recognizes his status, and notes to himself that it is not nice to have personal information in plain sight. The man advises the hero to better hide his status window, although it has no effect on patronage holders. The hero asks what can be hidden, and it turns out that he knows nothing. The elder thought a mysterious elf had infiltrated instead of a brave hero. However, to his astonishment, this hero turned out to be a simple villager from far away. The hero, frustrated, asks the elder a question, to which he receives an affirmative answer. The elder later reveals that the evil rock has become the link between this village and the elves. The gnolls, dispossessed of their homeland by the greed of the elves, have infiltrated even human lands, robbing many people of their families. It is this village that has become a fortified foothold for all those who seek revenge for the past. So numerous mercenaries have gathered here, but as time passes, few remember the power of that implacable hatred. And at the same time, the goddess begins to manifest her wrath. The elder speaks of the fact that most of the people here are young young men who have come from the city to gain experience. Then, before stepping back, the elder asks the hero if he can ask him a question. The hero agrees. The man declares that a long time has passed and asks the lad why the drug added to his dinner still does not show its effect. In response, the hero sharply draws his dagger and seeks to pierce the enemy, but his hand stops dead near the enemy's neck. The elder explains that cunning elves are highly resistant to medicines, and this magic was developed just for such cases. The man suggests that the hero surrender, for this invisible cord he will not be able to untie, not being immune to such substances. The hero still doesn't understand what's going on. The man informs the boy that it is not his fault. He urges the hero to consider it a mere failure. And then the goddess reminds the hero that she warned him in advance. Then the hero is imprisoned, and during this time, the elder reflects on the gnolls. He sees them as victims, just like the humans. He considers the real culprits to be those who ignited this conflict by taking their lands from the gnolls. His real enemy is the elves. The elder invites the hero to consider his status. Then we will be able to see his characteristics. The elder's name is Crimson and his level is 16. His patronage is Observation, E, and he is also burdened with the elf curse, C. The hero notices a curse. It consists in the fact that the elder, 
as an enemy of the elves, has had his life and youth shortened, and all the damage and insults he has received from the elves have become much more severe. The hero asks the elder if this curse was sent by the goddess or not. The man answers that this curse is hatred for all the elves he has killed, and it has honored and scarred him. The boy, immersed in reflection, realizes that not only the merciless goddess can bring a curse. He also tells the elder that he is not an elf. The man instantly points the dagger at the hero's face and asks where he got the dagger. The boy remembers where he got the dagger, but decides to lie. The hero says he killed the elf who wounded him. The elder claims that the hero unexpectedly killed the elf of royal origin. The hero repeatedly asks if this is true. The elder confirms that it is. He also admits that he no longer wishes to kill the hero, at which point the hero asks for mercy. The elder then tells him that he is a mage without magical patronage, but the hero still does not understand anything. The elder asks the hero if he really knows. Nothing. The boy replies that he is an Asa. The man does not understand who Asa is, and the hero explains to him that Asa is a lone wolf wandering the wastelands. The elder, with a wise look, turns to the hero and reveals to him that Asa is a magnificent word, though the hero will no longer be able to roam the wasteland, and this fills him with regret. At that time, the goddess, humbly praying for the hero's peace, watches over what is happening. The elder then lights the candles with green flame and removes the chained girl, placing his foot on her shoulder. He declares that he is the dark mage and the hero will be the victim, thus increasing the elder's lifespan. His face shines with madness as he says that though he has been struck by the elf curse, he is able to resist it and prolong his life through sacrifices. In gratitude for destroying the elf of royal blood, the elder promises to kill the hero painlessly. The hero, with an ironic smile, wonders if he should be grateful for it. In his thoughts, the hero realizes that all is not so bad. Despite the fact that he was thrown away like an unwanted shoe by some unpleasant god, he is still able to speak. He turns to the elder. The elder asks what the hero desires and warns that prayers for mercy will not help. The hero replies, however, that it is not about that. The man allows the hero to say whatever he wants, for he cannot ignore the dying man's last will. At this time, the hero hears the sighs of the bound girl. He notices that she is making noise and decides to punish her. The elder repeatedly asks the hero what he wanted to say. The hero, in his contemplation, wonders if the elder beat the girl on purpose to frighten him. The hero tells the elder that it is probably difficult to follow a path that no one recognizes. These words inspire the elder, and a smile appears on his face. He excitedly asks the hero if he understands him. The hero replies that yes, he understands, for he is an Asa. The elder interrogates the meaning of the word Asa and realizes that he himself could be Asa. But the goddess confidently declares that he is not. The hero's soul also becomes doubtful, and he wonders if he has succeeded. In arousing the elder's sense of kinship, the elder then says that the hero is to his liking, but that he, being an Asa, must remain alone. The hero does not understand the man's logic. First the elder intended to kill him in the name of his beliefs, and now he intends to kill him to preserve his loneliness. In response, the goddess simply bursts into laughter, and the hero remarks that there is nothing funny about it. The elder, with a mad expression on his face, begins to say that today is truly a happy day, for he has finally met someone who can appreciate his grand plans. And he turns to Khan, telling him to watch carefully. In his mind, the hero asks himself how he got himself into all this. Then the elder approaches the guy hanging upside down and says that maybe we should start with him. This does not please the elf, and he begins to say something in his own language. The elder tells the elf that this will lead nowhere, for the female elf must survive to please the elder. Then the elder lowers the elf into the circle of runes and says it's time to begin. He begins to cast his spell, and it goes like this, mother of all living things. Lord of destiny. Let me take this elf's remaining years. Then the runic circle begins to glow with a bright pink light. The elder shows magical signs with his hands and tells the elf to give him all his remaining years of life. The elf decides to remain silent, and the elder tells him that he will send the female elf right after him. With a mad expression on his face, the elder tells the elf that he has already understood the cost of rejecting his mercy. The elder then grabs the elf by the hair, threatening him, and the elf utters in his own language that he hands over his remaining years. 
and the contract is made. The heroine himself asks if the elder has been rejuvenated by the years taken away from the elf or something else. The elder then tells the hero that his magic was a success. But the hero tells the elder that he is not the least bit younger. The man replies that it is because he is not human. He says that he does not kill elves to prolong his life. The elder then asks the hero if he has any idea how many lives of elves and travelers he has taken during his stay in the village, and therefore the curse of the elves is not worth the attention. The elder then begins to recall his past. He tells us that once, as a human, he received a curse and immediately grew old and sick. But then a wandering magician staying in the village offered him one experiment. The elder decides to open his clothes, and the hero does not understand what is happening. Suddenly the hero sees the face of a knoll on the elder's chest, and he is very surprised. The boy asks the elder if he is a knoll, and gets an affirmative answer. This causes indescribable amazement to our hero, who cannot understand how a creature that is a hybrid of a man and a knoll stands before him. The elder, quite delighted, asks the hero, is it not magnificent? The courageous man replies that he represents the union of two races, their hearts imbued with a burning hatred of the elves his essence, and he is about to exact his revenge. The hero, unable to resist, asks the elder if he intends to take revenge alone. The courageous man answers that it is enough, and his power of dark magic is unmatched. The elder declares that he pursues the elbows using their own powers, and isn't that the perfect revenge? The hero reminds him that he himself is not an elf, but before he can finish his sentence, the elder interrupts him, saying that they shouldn't be bothered with trivialities. The elder then puts his hand on the hero's shoulder and tells him that he has revealed to him the world of Asa, where he was able to realize his true identity. And then the elder tells the hero that he is the real Asa, the lone knoll conquering the wasteland. The manly man replies to the hero that he can never be for him, but in gratitude he will carefully guard his life. The boy asks the manly man if he is going to kill him after all. The elder cheerfully replies that yes, for he is an ass. The hero looks angrily at the elder and inwardly realizes that this has taught him that true outsiders are indeed dangerous. The elder then informs him that the fateful moment has arrived. And now our events are transported to other characters. We see the princess walking in a field against the backdrop of a majestic castle. The story goes that the princess was nicknamed genius in the magical kingdom of the Archimages. She had a burning passion for hard-working people. Then an elder approaches the princess and asks if imagining magic is enough to make it a reality, or is there another effective formula? In response, someone suggests that because of the princess's talent, she was inspired by Eubora's perseverance, who continued to try even after it was explained that magic is defined by heritage and scholastic ties. The princess concluded that Eubora should be her first apprentice. Eubora's question inspires the princess, and she tells the girl that it is a great question. The princess explains that it is enough to imitate her mentor or parents to enhance her magic. Then the princess decides to show her new magic. A miniature ice bunny appears in her hand. One of the girls in the crowd assumes that it is ice magic. After that, we show the princess ancestors, and someone says that due to the hereditary abilities of the royal family, they have always had a unique fire magic. The princess declares that this ice magic belongs to her and offers the heroes to try it. However, the elder begins to conjure with his hands, but nothing happens. The princess is embarrassed to say that, as a mentor, she still lacks experience. She says that when she becomes more skilled, her first apprentice will be able to repeat ice magic easily. The headman thanks the princess for her detailed explanation. Afterwards, one girl in the crowd asks the princess what to do for those who have no patronage. This sets off a chain reaction from everyone else, and they begin to say that they too need magical patronage. Then the princess invites them to decide which of the heroes will be her second apprentice. This provokes a heated argument among everyone, and each offers his or her candidacy. Together they beg the hero to accept them as apprentices. But the princess destroys their alliance with one phrase and forces them to confront each other. The princess then tells everyone to announce how they will decide who will be the second apprentice. Then the elder asks the princess if it was planned by her. The princess does not understand what the girl is talking about. The girl replies that she didn't mean anything by it. Then the princess suggests that the lesson begin. 
The girl suggests going back to the moment when the princess showed them the ice bunny. The princess says that individual magic can be mastered through many mistakes and endless practice. The elder asks if this process is similar to the study of dark magic. These words upset the princess, and she lowers her eyes? The princess says that dark magic is different from light magic. It cannot be mastered by effort alone. Dark magic always requires sacrifice during its use. And at that moment we see Khan standing in the middle of a circle of runes, ready to die. Khan does not understand how he came to be at the mercy of this mad old man. Then the elder tells Khan to announce that he is surrendering his life to the elder. The boy asks the elder if the victim's consent is needed to use dark magic. The elder says no, for the use of dark magic is paramount. A great victory awaits those who are willing to sacrifice everything, including their lives. But Khan refuses, he says he is not yet ready to give up his life. The elder says he has no choice, and begins to use dark magic without Khan's consent. Then the wise man, turning to the hero, asks the reason for his presence. The young man replies that he is Misa's lover. The sage declares that such a connection is impossible, grasps the boy by his clothes and assures him that he is fully aware of everything that happens in the village. He warns the hero that attempts to use petty stratagems based on the elder's good heart will not succeed. Inwardly, the hero wonders, believing that the elder is probably out of his mind, but nevertheless, he faithfully performs his duties. It is because of this that the conversation goes smoothly. Khan recognizes that the wise man is right Misa is dating Khal and the hero should not try to take advantage of the elder's kindness by using such petty tricks. Internally, the hero thinks that the elder may have had mental problems, but still performed his duties properly. However, this conversation allows them to understand each other better. The sage asks the hero to provide proof of his words that he is really Nisa's boyfriend. The hero offers the sage to smell him. The sage listens and indeed smells Nisa. He states that the smell could not have come from the hero's body if they were not lovers. The elder replies that a meeting with Nisa is impossible, because if Nisa disappears, Giri and Kal will begin to harbor suspicions. The hero agrees, but inwardly he realizes that the elder has even considered eliminating Misa as an apology. The sage then asks the hero if he still has any wishes. Khan replies that if he survives, let the sage let him go until he and Misa meet. The sage asks, even if it means that the creature, deprived of many years of life, will not be able to survive? But the hero cannot think of anything else. The wise man agrees to Khan's request and promises him, and Khan, in turn, also promises him. Thus, their bargain is considered sealed. The hero feels a sharp pain. He curses the wise man inside himself, for he claimed he would do it painlessly. Afterwards, the wise man wishes Khan a happy journey and promises to tell Misa that Khan is dead. But the hero tells the wise man with a confident smile that there will be difficulties, for Misa has died before. The sage doesn't understand what this means. Suddenly he is punched in the face by the hero, and their fight begins. The wise man calls the hero a bastard and says he has deceived him. But the hero says that in fact the wise man deceived him by promising to send him to the other world painlessly. And the pain from the spell was unbearably severe. The sage cannot believe his eyes and asks the hero why he is still alive. The hero prepares his hand and says he will tell when he dies. Finally, the paralyzing spell dissipates. The goddess then soars over the hero, spreading her arms, and reports that her patronage has even restored the hero's shortened lifespan. Then the wise man says that he does not understand how a guy who almost lost his life was able to survive. And the hero reminds the sage of his promise to let him go and the time has come to fulfill the promise. Now the hero takes his dagger from the table and notices the bound elves sitting on the floor. He cuts their handcuffs with a stroke of his dagger and says that he now has a witness. Realizing that the girl has no strength to walk, Khan lifts her onto his shoulder. This causes great surprise and embarrassment to the girl. The hero heads for the exit and tells the wise man to remember to keep his promise. This angered the man and he orders Kanu to stop. The sage says that the promise is a waste of words and that it doesn't matter. If he gets rid of the years of life he got from Khan, then the sage begins to recite the incantation, and the hero realizes that it was not a bluff. The sage says that he is disappointed in his like-minded man, 
and he will have to give up the idea of killing the hero painlessly. The boy says it's too early to give it up. The wise man becomes even more angry, for the hero still keeps talking. But suddenly the wise man begins to feel that he is losing his strength and does not understand what is happening. He begins to squirm with pain and anger. The hero asks the man, what is going on? Is the sage's power draining away? And the hero inwardly tells himself that since he has been subjected to dark magic, it is as if he has opened his eyes to new sensations. The sage begins to grow old before his eyes. He says he can't believe it, since no human has been able to stand so far, and the sage asks the hero if the hero is a vampire with unlimited life expectancy, and asks the hero who he really is. The hero begins to tell who he is, but the goddess tells him not to try to appear mysterious. The hero then replies that he is an apostle of the goddess Asa. This causes great embarrassment to the goddess. After that, the guy realizes that if he kills a level 13 sage, he will get a huge amount of experience at once. Suddenly the elder strikes the hero with a crushing blow, cutting him with his own hand. Then, with amazement in his eyes, he turns to the hero and asks if he is surprised by what has happened. The Grand Elder calls this incredible power the Sword of the Null, which he has been saving for the hunt for elves, but all that has changed because of the hero. However, unexpectedly, the hero heals his wound, much to the surprise of the Elder, who was convinced of the lethality of his strike on Kansas. With a face full of determination, Ken confirms the Elder's rightness, for this time was indeed dangerous. Then the Elder suddenly realizes that he has exhausted his power and begins to run, but he is caught by the leg of an elf woman. At this time, the hero approaches the elder and strikes him, cutting off his head, but satisfaction does not come as the elder finds himself in possession of another head on his chest. As he prepares to pierce the second head, the hero hears the elder's words of apology to his daughter for failing to take revenge. Ken then wishes the elder all the best and, having crushed the enemy for good, completes the deed. The goddess then expresses a deep sadness that does not leave the hero indifferent. He agrees with her words. Now the hero gathers all the villagers and frees the elves. He notices that even a squad of self-guards has arrived and helped resolve the situation. But only at first glance one would think that the case was over. The hero hears the elves speak and does not understand their words. All the humans begin to stare at Ken in wonder. Suddenly he runs away, wondering what the damn elves said. And, jumping off the cliff and cursing the fantasy world, he flees from the deadly arrows fired by the elves.